Alrighty, hey guys, I hope everybody out there is having a blessed and wonderful day. Today we get to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's the last chapter in this short little epistle, but uh, I know I have found it really enjoyable to um, reread, and I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I hope maybe you've learned something or pulled something new from it, or at the very least, that it has just fired you up to want to read more on your own. Um, God's Word is so nourishing. It is our guiding light. It's the framework against which we live. It is, it's God in our hands, in a sense. Um, all right, guys, so let's pray, and we'll get into this last chapter and what I have to share with you guys over it, and probably, let me talk about this real quick, probably over the course of the next week, I have got a ton of really long work days ahead of me, helping to get ready for this auction that my family's auction company is handling, and Hopefully, I'm going to be able to make some new videos over the coming week, but they're probably going to be something a little bit different, something a little bit shorter, or I'm not exactly sure yet. I still want to be able to try to make some new videos, but I know I'm not going to have the typical three to four hour block of time that I need to be able to read and write and put one of these together. So it will be something a little different, hopefully still enjoyable. All right, that out of the way, let me pray and we'll get into this, guys. Heavenly Father, Father God, we just want to come before you today, Lord, and say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for waking me up, Lord. Thank you for the breath in my lungs, the fire in my belly, the hunger for you. Thank you for enabling me to be able to wake up and not have to worry about getting high, to not have to worry about keeping this lie together or that lie together, to not have to worry about going out the door and having a warrant for my arrest or, or being filled with anger and pain and hurt. None of that, God. None of that. You have, you have absolutely transformed me, Father God, inside and out, and I am so thankful for that, and I know you have done the same out here for people. Father God, we love you so much. We love you so much, and we want to have a more intimate, more profound, more active relationship with you, Father God. Help us to do that, Lord. Help these words that we read today, Lord, to nourish us, to, to jump off the page and become illuminated, to become things that beckon and call to us, pulling us into your word, pulling us down the rabbit hole of faith and grace and mercy. Father God, we just want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for your presence in our lives, Lord. The fact that in a ever-changing, shifting, temporal world, you are eternal, Father God. You are unchanging the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You do not lie. You do not deceive. You are not the father of chaos. Father God, we thank you for the atoning sacrifice of your Son and our Savior, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out that day at Pentecost. We ask, Father God, for a hedge of protection around the lives and a blood covering over the hearts and over the minds of children and the infirm and anyone unable to do so for themselves, Lord. Help us to be that bright and shining city on a hill. Help us to be fired up to carry on with the role of servant, Lord. Father God, we ask that you be with us today, Lord, and that you guide us, lead us, and direct us, Lord. And we pray all of this in the heavenly, holy, mighty, and righteous name of your Son and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, guys. Oh my goodness, my iced coffee is really good today, guys. <laughs> Alrighty, so... <clears throat> Preach the word is the little subheading on mine, guys. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Let's go. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. 
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychius I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I have left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom to him be glory forever and ever amen greet prisca and aquila and the household of onesiphorus erasta stayed in corinth but trophimus i have left in Miletus sick do your uttermost to come before winter Eubulus greets you as well as Putin, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. So be it and so be it. Right, guys, what a what a loving little send-off. And we're going to talk about um we're going to talk about him wanting him to hurry before winter gets there and, and what that what that entails and how kind of really touching and simple and beautiful that is, in my opinion. Um, let's jump back here to the beginning of chapter four, see what I got to share with you guys. First off, as always, thank you for letting me. All right, you lovely souls, I'm Rex. This is Walking in the Word. And that daily bread that we were just blessed with was the fourth and final chapter of Paul's second epistle, his second pastoral letter written to Timothy, his spiritual son, and next in line to bear the torch of the gospel truth. Now, while we are separated by millennia from the pinning of this, Paul still speaks to you and to me as a father, as a offering up a guiding light as a spiritual father, as we push ahead with our own walks of faith and push ahead ourselves with carrying on in our part in the Great Commission. Recall that this is the last chapter, the final words penned by Paul on his way to leave these earthly confines. He says, we must always come to God's word, making it a priority of truly penultimate value. By its guidance, the worthwhile is accomplished, and outside of it, outside of scripture, I ask, what is made that is worth value? What is there? I would argue, Little to quite probably nothing. Now, before jumping to today's verses, let's look 
at what the whole letter sort of alludes to, but that chapter 4, verse 7 makes specifically clear. And that is the goal uh, of finishing well, the goal of going out strong. However, we should understand this a very certain way because in our Bibles, it's worded, let me read it to you real quickly. I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. It seems like when you read that, that the emphasis is on I. So it can seem like Paul is being boastful. But this is not Paul boasting, nor is it filled with self-pride. His goal was to go out and finish strong, and this is what he did. But if we look, in fact, at the original wording here, and the order declared, it says, the good fight I have fought. In the original text, it was worded as, the good fight I have fought. In other words, the emphasis was on, not I, but on the fight. And that was because the fight was God's fight. So that's where the emphasis belonged. The faithful soldier, one like Paul, is only able to endure the fight like we daily endure in our own walks of faith. And that is singularly as a gift of God's utterly unwarranted gift of grace. That's how we can endure. That's how the good fight can be fought by people who are flesh and bone. Let's look at verses 1 and 2, guys. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So Timothy was being called on by Paul to be more than a cover band. He wasn't just called to be or to play the old hits of Paul. He also wasn't called to just be a, re a reboot, as we would call it today, of Paul. Not just to mimic what Paul did. No, Timothy was being called on to take the mantle and the mission from Paul and to carry on with Paul's work because Paul had only began the work. Even Timothy would not finish the work. They were just able to carry on with the work Paul started. This draws to mind, or at least to my mind, someone like Joshua who followed after Moses or Elisha who would take on after Elijah. Now, in modernity, I want to talk about something. In modernity, today, in Spain, in Barcelona, there is a large cathedral that is still being built. Now, it was designed by a man named Antony Gaudi. And Gaudi lived from 1852 to 1926. And he undertook the building of this beautiful Catholic cathedral, very different, full of all this nature-inspired um, design. And it would be called the Basilica de la Sagrada Familia. And this is in Barcelona. It was began in 1882. 40 plus years before Gaudi's death. But after 40 years, it was still not finished. And in fact, it has been built on ever since and will still only be completed in 2026. On the, on the centennial anniversary of Gaudi's death. So he worked on it for 44 years. Other people have worked on it for what will be a hundred years. And as amazing as 144 years is to put in on a single task, how much more so the great commission that we all get to be a part of. We get to place bricks in the same wall that Paul and Timothy placed bricks in. How amazing is that? One more thing that is so much bigger than us that our faith in God allows us to be a part of. I think that's amazing, guys. Um, let's look at verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. So this is sort of the preamble to the I have fought the good fight thing. Okay, guys, so if we look to Numbers 15, we find a 
chapter that records the Levitical system. And what's detailed there, we find that the drink offering marked the conclusion of a sacrificial ceremony. Such well-ordered sacrifice and devotion had been trademarks of Paul's walk, allowing the gift of God to produce in Paul a life that was in itself a profound sacrifice and offering. Now a side note, and worth sharing, I think, due to its beauty, deals with the word departure here. Let's reread that, guys. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. So let's talk about that word departure, because this is a word that's in it, that when in its original text was in fact very suggestive of a boat that was moored and tied off on a dock being untied and loose and allowed to float away from its moorings. In other words, what anchored, what anchored it no more, sorry, <clears throat> it was loose from its mooring. Something that once anchored was no more, just as Paul's life answers God's undeniable call, and it too drifts away to a new anchorage, one in eternity. Sorry guys, I promise. Well, no, I don't promise. I, maybe one day my handwriting will get better. That's what I'll say. Don't hold your breath out there, people. <laughs> It would probably be better if I thought somebody else was going to read it, but it's me, so I'll be honest, I get a little lazy. <laughs> Let's look at verse 8, guys. It says, <clears throat> Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So what is this crown of righteousness? What should we understand this as? Well, from what I can find, there appear to be two takes. I know which one I lean towards. I'll present it last, and I'll present the other first. So, it kind of goes like this. One says, one take says that the crown of righteousness is a crown gifted to those who claimed righteousness through faith in Christ and bore the fruit of this out in a faithful life. The other take, and the one I kind of lean towards, says that the above crown, the crown of righteousness, is given to the faithful, marking the climax of the newly passed individual's process of sanctification. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. My goodness, guys, I really hope you have enjoyed this time here. For Demos, let's go ahead and read 9. We'll go ahead and read 9, 10, and 11, okay? Be diligent to come to me quickly, Paul talking to Timothy. For Demos has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. All right, guys, so Demos was a... You can call him a fair weather. We can call him a wishy-washy friend. And likewise, he was a wishy-washy believer. Okay? Now, as an example that we can change, we move from Damas to look at Mark. Mark, who Paul had labeled a quitter in Acts chapter 15, verses 37 through 40. And yes, this is the Mark of the Gospel. Um, Paul had labeled him a quitter and... If you read the situation, somewhat rightly so, due to Mark's poor follow-through. But what's important here is that Mark got back on track. Mark rededicated himself. And we can see Christian forgiveness' work here because we see that in Paul's attitude, he is ready to call on Mark. He doesn't think that that's who Mark is anymore. You know, Demas just was a person who never laid hold of that in faith. Let's look at verse... 16, guys. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. So he's saying, you know, I got called up here to defend this, and none of you guys, who everybody who said they were with me, nobody was with me. Everybody forsook me. 
But he also says, may it not be charged against them. So I'm sure that when you read this, your mind probably goes to the same place I do because, well, Paul is an apostle of Christ and so much Paul did mimic Christ. So much of what Paul did modeled Christ. Here we have Paul voicing a call for forgiveness in the face of certain death. Something so heavily reminiscent of Luke chapter 23 verse 34. Guys, let's jump back there just because... All right, guys, and it reads like this, Luke 23, 34, and this is Jesus Christ talking. Then Jesus said, as he was upon the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Okay, now let's jump to Acts. We're going to jump to Acts real quick. I wasn't planning on jumping to all these, but let's do it real quick. Acts chapter 7, I believe it's verse 60. And it goes like this. And this is Stephen talking. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep of euphemism for Stephen's death, being the first martyr for the faith. Um, so yeah, as I said, Paul's, call for forgiveness is so reminiscent of Jesus Christ's call for forgiveness in Luke, and it's very close to Stephen's call for forgiveness in Acts chapter 7, verse 60. And we have to remember that this death with Stephen, this martyr's death of Stephen, was one witnessed by Paul, and one that a young Paul, still very misguided, approved of at the time. Okay? All right, guys, let's look at verse... 21, and it's going to be the last one I have to share with you guys today. Again, I really pray you've enjoyed it. All right, guys, and it reads like this. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. So he says to, to Timothy, his spiritual son, do your utmost to come before winter. So here I wrote, let's close on a verse that reveals such humanity and humility and reveals a very intimate, truly father-son-like bond between these two. What we have here, I wrote, is a ancient version of the call to hurry before the roads ice up, basically. Any delay in travel, and there would certainly be delays in the wintertime with ocean and sea-bound travel in this area, any delay in travel could cause Timothy to not make it to Paul before he is executed. So what I wrote here was, perhaps Paul really did need that cloak before winter got there. I mean, that is likely true, but I can't help but feel like, you know, as men, we try to be really tough. We try to be really tough, especially sometimes with other men. We try to be really tough, you know, and um, and I don't mean in like an arrogant macho way. I mean, in like a we want to be there and to hold each other up type of way. So I can't help but feel like perhaps the cloak was needed, but perhaps also it was a great way to say, hurry up, my spiritual son. I need you here with me. I need you here with me in this moment. Just as much as you need to be here so you can carry on with this mission, I need you here with me, my spiritual son. I kind of feel like there's a real touch of that in this letter. Um, all right, guys. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, hit subscribe if you haven't already. Why haven't you? Um, I drop a new video like this six days a week, guys, and... Father God tells us that he has no greater joy than to know that his children walk in the truth. That's what this is right here. It's God's truth. It's God's love letter to mankind in our need. It's a mirror that we can look at ourselves in and see who we really are. We also see who God really is. We learn the history of our faith and the, and the narratives that involve our brothers and sisters across millennia. Um... Hit the bell if you want notified every time I drop a new video. Give this one a thumbs up if you liked it. 
share it if you loved it. If you have any prayer requests, any comments, questions, suggestions, if you have a witness or a testimony, I would love for you to include that down here. Um, really anything, guys. And with that in mind, I hope you know that I love you so much. Father God loves you even more. Now do me a favor. Go out there. Have a blessed day. Let everybody you see know that Jesus loves them. I promise they need to hear it.